come here and uh, really speak to you guys. We put, try to put a program together that would be diverse with a lot of talent and also go through some of the basics that are there as well as some more advanced topics. How many people out here are uh, practice hair restoration? Can you see a show of hands? Okay, so I think we're going to, hopefully some of the speakers will focus more toward the beginning side, beginner level, and then uh, also address some, maybe some more advanced topics as well. Um, we'll stay on time for the speakers, just some information. I'm going to try to keep you guys on schedule. Since there's no uh, time allotment you see over here, if you're about five to two minutes left, I will give you an indication to stay on time. And I will try to make this as organic as possible so some of you guys will uh, be able to share your expertise when it's called for. I'm going to start with something really basic. So this is going to be geared to the people that don't do hair and really don't have much understanding of hair restoration, even though they may be seasoned plastic or cosmetic surgeons. First of all, I think it's really important to understand that hair loss is a progression. It is what I call a speeding train. It's something, especially in men, that over time, men will continue to lose hair. And you'll see that you need to think of how they're going to look like in 10 to 15 years from now. It's something that we don't, when we start out in practice, really consider. We just say, well, this person is going to be a good candidate. We'll put some hair up there. And soon enough, that 20-year-old that you thought was a good candidate becomes very advanced in his balding, retaining what you transplanted, and you have this very weird artificial tuft of hair that is left, and you have nothing else in the donor area to transplant. So I like to use this slide of understanding the difference between what happens with donor and supply. It's a bad economic situation here because the donor continues to deplete over time, both from just aging as well as from donor depletion of harvesting that. And also, uh, your, your supply and your demand continues to become more and more uh, necessary as someone matures. So always, always think as an ethical surgeon, someone that's not just jumping the gun to go do a transplant because you have some basic tool sets, but you're thinking forward in time of how that hair is going to mature. It's something that obviously takes experience to understand what is safe. And I hope that through the course of this education, you're going to start to understand what is safe and what is not. So it's a, it's a bad situation of supply and demand that increasingly gets worse. So this is just a basic Norwood pattern scale of what hair loss occurs in men or male pattern baldness. The reason I put this up here, even though it's a basic textbook slide, is the fact that we need to understand it. If we don't understand hair loss patterns out there and we start to just put hairlines up on people, people will look weird and you probably won't be able to tell. And I can tell you one thing, as someone that's been doing this for about 10 years now, when I started my first two to three years, I couldn't see fake results. And that doesn't mean the toupee or something that's so glaringly obvious if you say, look, I can tell that's fake. I'm talking about really subtle things that probably, you know, I was, I was at a meeting, I think it was in San Diego in January, and I was sitting next to a colleague, a facial plastic surgeon, and he says, oh, I can tell fake results. And I said, that guy has a toupee, that guy's got a transplant. He goes, there's no way. And I said, look, you won't see this for years. It requires years of seeing hairlines to understand what is artificial and what is natural. Um, you know, we run a course in St. Louis, and I, I work with uh, new people drawing hairlines, and I watch them, and they, they it look so easy, but when they draw it, there's something wrong with it. And I have everyone else look at them, and I say, what is wrong? And it's one of those things that if you don't understand how hair is naturally lost through the Norwood system, you won't understand how to naturally replace it. So please go back and study that. So what is male pattern baldness? Is it just hair that you have and then hair goes away? This is a really easy slide, but it may seem so easy for those that are experienced in the room, but it's something that in my opinion is fundamental. Because hair loss in men is not, I have hair one day, then it goes away. It's hairs that start in what we call terminal hairs, which are the thick hairs that we're born with, and they become vellus hairs, miniaturized hairs. We also know it as tiny little hairs that are shorter, flimsier, thinner, see-through. And those vellus hairs then eventually go away to zero. So I really want you to remember this slide, especially when we start talking about medical management for hair loss, because I think it's one of those things that if you encapsulate this in your brain, you're going to be able to, to practice safer surgery, and you're, you're going to be able to understand the process. And through understanding the process of hair loss, you're going to be able to transplant someone more safely. So what happens here is that through this transition from thick ter uh, terminal hairs to vellus hairs to no hair, I'm going to just briefly talk about it. We're going to talk about it more in a minute. The medicines 
help to take someone from a vela state and bring them back to terminal, slow down terminal to vellus loss. But when you've got to the point where they're completely bald in that zone, it's very hard for the medicine to do anything effective. And we'll talk more about what medicine is in a moment in the next, in the next talk. So please try to remember this slide. It's a very, very fundamental slide that will help you understand male pattern baldness. So donor dominance, let's go back to the really basics here. Uh, you probably will hear from Dr. Kabaka a little bit about the history of hair restoration, but it all started with Norman Orentreich in the 50s and understanding that the hairs that are transplanted from the back of the head have retained those characteristics as it's placed into the front of the head, so they're not lost. Again, that may be something so obvious to those that understand hair, but it may be very uh, not obvious to those that don't do hair. So I want to stress that idea is that when hairs are moved from an area that's called safe, so you think of the baldest man still has a horseshoe in the back, that hair that is not genetically programmed for loss, moved to the front, will not be lost. Uh, generally speaking, there's some caveats, but just for the sake of simplicity, will not be lost. And that's why it's so important, as I was mentioning in my first couple slides, that if you put this aggressive hairline in someone at 25 or very young and they rapidly progress with loss into 45, they may just have this tuft of transplanted hair and everything around it with a horseshoe and it can look very odd. So be very careful, especially in young individuals, young men. Anyone under 30, is, if, you're, if you're a starting surgeon, be careful, be safe, be ethical, and you don't even know what ethical is until you understand the safety parameters. So the goal of this meeting is to teach you artistic technical surgery, we can't do that in a day, but we, I do want to introduce the fundamental limits of safety, which are going to be something I really want to stress, so stop. This slide is up here for two reasons. Number one, stay safe. Understand the things that you don't know and slowly build to the point where you're, you're going to be safe. But also introduces female hair loss, because female hair loss is a much more complicated subject matter than male pattern hair loss, because there's a lot of things that go, in, go, go involved that I would suggest if you're just starting in the world of hair, don't just dive into female uh, uh, transplantation. Uh, there will be a talk that I'll be giving about how to do female hair restoration. It's an advanced topic. It's a great topic to understand if you're just starting out to understand what you can and cannot do. But I want you to understand that the complexity of female uh, hair restoration begins with the understanding of female hair loss because it's, it can't be taken for granted as just simply a androgenetic or male pattern loss that they're having due to hormonal influences. There can be a lot of uh, ideologic factors. And usually the most fundamental ones, if you see someone, for example, who's premenopausal, maybe a teenager coming in with a lot of shedding, it, it oftentimes is due to a, uh, a low iron level due to heavy menses, for example, and you don't want to just go and transplant that person because it's probably a medically related issue. So you really want to do the medical workup on the front end. Almost all my female patients to some degree get a medical workup before I just transplant them. I think it's important to at least think about med medical issues before you start. Low thyroid levels, uh, usually that doesn't make me not operate on them, but at least lets me start to get them replaced on their thyroid uh, hormones. And there's a lot of uh, other things that would pre preclude my ability to transplant them, which would move over to skin th issues like what's called scarring alopecias, like lupus. Um, different, I'm not going to get into that, it's too complicated, but just, uh, just understand there are certain, certain situations when you see like a red scaly patchy loss that you're, you should not just run in there and transplant them. Um, and that's something that for a starting surgeon may be not obvious. You know, they, they have a little ring of circle here, there's a hair loss, it's, you know, it could be alopecia areata, which could fail a transplant. You just think, well, they've got a bald spot, let's just stick hair in there. And so these are the things that, again, safety, 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 remember, safety, remember that big stop sign I had. So in women, it can be more complicated. Enlist the help of an internist or endocrinologist and possibly even a dermatologist that could do a skin biopsy if you're wondering. Always err on the side of caution. Enlist those people that can help you before you jump ahead and do a transplant. And especially, as I said, if you're going to do a female transplant, I hope you have a few years of experience doing men before you jump into doing women because, there's, as you'll hear from my talk on female transplants, there are some things that are going to be a little bit more complicated that you may not have thought about when you do that. Indications for female hair loss, there are really two big ones. Now, obviously, there's, it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, probably smaller subcategories, but one is just hair loss. 
uh, just women that lose hair. We'll talk about different patterns of, of loss that are there um, in a moment. But, uh, and we'll talk more about the strategies of technical transplantation later on. And also just a, a, a hairline lowering. Either you're going to do it surgically, that Dr. Gabacher is well known for, or you're going to do it through transplantation using grafts to bring the hairline lower because they're just genetically born with a very high male uh, hairline. The, um, the uh, hair loss patterns for women typically occur to make it easy for you uh, not to go through traction types of loss which are from too much tension and various other ideologies. Just fundamentally, I would divide it into a Ludwig pattern which is, there's one, two, and three. There's different levels of diffuse loss that occurs with or, with or without uh, retaining the hairline. And this is a type of Ludwig pattern of loss. And this is what uh, Elise Olson refers to as the Christmas tree pattern, which she uh, asserts is the most common type. And in other words, if you look at it, you can see the apex of the tree and the, at the occiput. And you can see going down, there's the base of the tree. And uh, there is either spares the hairline or involves the hairline. So something that if you don't know that, have them part the hair, maybe slightly wet it, have them look down, and you can sometimes see this pattern. And then due to maybe postmenopausal changes, et cetera, there can be some frontal temporal recession very analogous to male pattern baldness. And this can be something that is also quite common in women as well. So that's basically my talk on uh, male and female hair loss. So again, my introduction is just for you to be a safe surgeon to understand the process before you begin to do the surgery. 